right. So welcome to the application statement uh, professional development session on research and uh, teaching and diversity statements. So we're going to start off. Stu's going to tell us a little bit about interpreting postings and putting together your packet. So if you're going to look for a position at a university, you got to think about where you're going to go searching. Um, this, what you're looking at here is a posting that would be at the university site. Obviously, you're going to look around in the back of Science Magazine, or you'll look on various searches and um, message boards in different places now it is. Um, but when you get to the actual posting that will be at the in this case, University of Buffalo, you're going to end up looking for the posting link that's going to describe all the information that you need to provide. And you you need to find out what is that list of things because it changes from university to university as to the number of different statements they want. It's going to depend on the type of appointment. Sorry. Sorry, Stu. My bad. No, go, go ahead to the next slide. Do you want, do you want me to? Okay. Yeah. And the All next right. one after that. All right. So you're going to take a look at not only the type of appointment it is as to whether or not it's, uh, if it's at a university, whether or not it's a tenure track or non-tenure track. The CSU has actually gone through a change. They now call them contract-based employees if they're non-tenure track. So it, it just sort of depends on how the university has names for these various positions but you want to make sure that you understand what it is. We get a lot of advertisements now that we that I, I bought a listserv for chairs around the country. And a lot of them now are, they are one or two year appointments as instructors in different places. And so you want to just make sure that what it is that you're applying for is, is what it is that you are interested in most of all. Because occasionally you'll, if you misread it, it, it might not be the match for what you really want to apply to. And as opposed to certain types of applications, you do not want to send blanket um, responses to, I like, say, a thousand positions. You want to actually be very careful about making sure you match the the application that you're going to send in very much to the to the job opening that's there. Right. So next. Right. So all of those expectations are going to follow the type of appointment and you know, the kinds of things they expect. So if it's going to be a tenure track appointment in a particular university there, it's normally going to contain research, service, and teaching. And those are the three things more or less that are there. There might be other things that they expect, but you're going to have to read through the entire job description to figure out what they are for particular universities. Because again, they can, they can be different. They're also going to have minimum and preferred qualifications. So the minimum qualifications are what search committees use to determine who they can cut out of their search immediately. So if they ask for and state that minimum qualifications are a PhD, for example, as opposed to a master's. So a, an instructor position might just need a master's degree. And that's fine. But if you don't have the master's degree, they won't even look at it. That'll be cut out before it gets to the committee to, for consideration. Under preferred qualifications, that's what they would rather see. So they can't cut you out of the, the pool if you have the minimum qualifications, but they can give preference to the ones that have exactly what they want. So it could be that the preferred qualifications are a PhD. It could be the preferred qualifications are a PhD in particular areas so that they might say, well, we want a PhD that is in economics, but not in, say, communications. Right. So you want to make sure that you actually check the preferred qualifications and in your letter, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that you want to address how you satisfy the preferred qualifications as much as possible. There is also going to be an effort distribution in the type of appointment. So particularly re related to the research, teaching and service, and you're mostly concerned when you're making the application to the research and teaching side. So if it's a 50% research and 50% teaching, that would put an emphasis on both and not on one or the other. Whereas if you're a researcher and that's the position you want to address at some point in the job you want, then you might look for something that's 60% or 70% research and a lot less teaching. So it sort of depends on what kind of universities you're looking for to uh, 
satisfy what you want to have as a career. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I have a quick question about the minimum for qualifications and on those, um, how, how firm do you think that they are? And, and does it vary? And I know that there are um, some studies on gender that suggest that women will wait to meet if that they uh, need to meet all feel they need to meet all of the qualifications in order to be able to apply and that um, men may meet 60% of the qualifications in order to apply. Do you have a sense of what that is? For, for minimum qualifications, so the the average number of people that apply for academic jobs is it at this point it's probably north of a hundred, right? So you're looking at a committee of people that if you don't meet minimum qualifications, they would just as soon not have to read through the entire application. So they will have somebody check for whether or not some people meet the minimum qualifications. And at that point, it's 100% because they're not going to be very stringent. The preferred qualifications, that's a longer list. And they will look at everybody to see how many of the preferred qualifications they meet and whether or not they can afford to do without characteristic A or Maybe if somebody's twice as good at B than A or three times better at C than A or B, that that's where you get into where there might be slight differences after they posted the ad, whether or not there are new things that came up. It's, it's hard to say, but if you make the minimum qualifications, they will consider it. And then the letter becomes more important as in terms of how well you meet a lot of the preferred qualifications. But if awesome. you meet all the minimums and you're interested in the job, don't not apply just because you don't have all the preferred. Apply if you have at least one or more of the preferred qualifications. There's no Brilliant. 60%. You're waiting too long. Do it. Great, great advice. Awesome. And I do have a favor to ask. Um, there's someone who made a mark on the screen and that's on your Zoom end. So I don't know if there's a way for you to erase that or, or take off the blue mark, but we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. I don't even know how that could happen. I don't know either. Oh, okay. um, so Stu's gonna tell you to do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to use Zoom, oh, apparently. So let's go to the next, the first, the, yeah. So you wanna look at the, the place you're applying to on a, a more than cursory level, right? So if you're going to take a place seriously that you want to apply to, then you want to think about what the culture is going to be there. If you're going to get to the point of interviewing at a, at a particular job opening, then you want to know that the culture is one that will fit what it is that you want to do. Um, huh. Okay. There's something about erasing the line. Maybe Serena, you could figure that one. Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> this okay. is something I haven't seen, so I'm trying. <laughs> so you want to think about what it is in the culture of the place you want to go to. You want to think about what are they known for? Is that a piece that you want to do? So from the search side of this, you frequently think or ask the question, do you want the best person available that you know, maybe they're, they've published more papers than everybody else? Or do you want somebody who fits the research profile or the teaching needs of the particular unit? And so the culture of the, the unit that you're applying to makes a big difference for how they'll look at your application. So if you were to apply, for example, uh, it's easier for me to use a biology example, but let's say you were to study plants, but everybody else in the department studied animals, that would be a bad match. Could you you both could, all, everyone could do out biology, but you wouldn't fit with a group of people that studied something different. Now, the same time the unit might actually want to expand their expertise. And in that case, the beginning of a plant unit in the division might actually be a great thing. So you might be the beginning of a extension. So you need to think about everything about the unit you'd be applying to and why your application would be one that they would want to look on and be favorable for. So it's not something that's easy to get out of the job description. You need to do a little Google homework and look at you know, all these aspects of the place that you'd be applying to. Right? So in this particular case, are you the only one there? And then reading their vision and mission statements um, 
if they're posted. So not every place posts their their code, um, but if they have it posted, then you can get a look at it. Um, reading vision and mission statements should be a lot simpler than it is. Um, to a large extent, it we actually talk about how to write mission statements and they're really difficult. Either they're, they're too general or they're not specific enough to what it is they really want to do or they've changed, but nobody's edited it in years. So, you know, you can get a lot of these things if they wrote a very good job description, then sometimes the vision and the mission will actually be in the job description. So you really need to learn to read between the lines for what they're looking for and what you're looking for because they actually have to match. Again, you don't want to write 100 of these. So you are allowed to contact the search chair. That person's name is in the ad so they can be contacted. So if you're unsure about what they're looking for, they, they can't give you any information that would make it more advantageous on the phone call, but they can clarify what is actually allowed or what the in general the department characteristics might be and maybe point you to a place on their website where you could find extra information. But don't call just to be on a phone call. Call because you've got a specific question about something that was in the ad that you thought was unclear. Yeah, and that would be your first contact. And so you wanna make sure that it's a good impression. Yeah. Um, same way querying journals, right? For article publication or something along those lines. You wanna make sure that, that you already know that you're serious about it. Right, it's particularly true for grants as well. Yeah, yeah, all right. So customizing your packet. So um, there, so the first bullet refers to um, covering things that might actually go in a letter because you're going to write a letter to the search as well as putting in a CV. So it's not like an industry job where you might think that the resume is going to be more important than everything else. If you're writing to a university, the cover letter becomes really important and make sure that you address it to the search chair and that you know enough about the title, it's in the ad. So make sure you tailor it to the exact job that you're applying for. Sometimes there'll be a search and they, I wrote a letter for a friend, colleague of mine and the department was doing a search for somebody both in physics and in uh, engineering. And they were two separate jobs. So you had to be really clear in terms of writing the letter just from the letter of support position that you know what job that person was applying for because there were more than one opening. And so you just need to make sure that it's tailored. So, and the next piece, right? So in your letter, you're gonna cover special characteristics of your CV that might not otherwise stand out. So most of you, I, I hope have started to put together your own CV and you should notice in a good or a bad way, that it's a list, right? You're just putting down items that you check the box. You have publications, you've got funding at some point, you've got degrees that came from university one, two, and three. It, and it's not particularly exciting to read a CV because it's just a long laundry list. Number of app, um, presentations that you've made, how many abstracts that that involves. But if you want them to look at particular aspects of your CV that point to how you fit the job description, then you have to highlight those features in the letter that you write that explains where you want them to look in your CV. Maybe you've made, you know, you fit the job application because something you were doing five years ago was particularly important, but it wouldn't maybe be obvious in your CV. You can make that obvious in the letter that you write. So make sure you feature the things that you want them to focus on. Right. And that's more or less what I just said. Um, you don't need multiple versions of your CV. That's actually going to be really drive you nuts. And again, it's the list. It's the letter that you write that's going to be specific to the each university or job that you're going to apply for. And that's why I say don't do a thousand. Right. A lot of us get letters from people that want to apply for jobs in different places. And the second it looks like a form letter, we delete them. Right? So you want to make sure that you're carefully considering each job that you apply to, and you're highlighting the things in your CV each time that are the ones that you want them to actually pay attention to. And the, the match that you're going to try and deliberately make obvious to them is the match in your CV to their job description. 
So just make sure that you've you've actually satisfied that for each individual job because they're all going to have different characteristics that are particularly going to be on their preferred list of qualifications. So next. But doesn't customize. So here we're talking about chat GBT. So if we go back um, and you think about that, that biomedical science job posting, right? Um, and uh, you're looking at customizing who you are in relation to that job to be able to make sure that you're um, connected to the culture of the department, that you're connected, connected to um, the details and specifics and articulating what um, skills you would bring to that position. And then here is just a, a chat GBT, write a one page application job letter. Um, and we included all of the details, right? What successful successful and um, candidates are expected to have, um, and what they're expected to do and, and teach based on that job posting. And this is what Chat GBT comes up with. Is a so remember structured what form said. letter. Yeah. Re remember what I said about any letter that anybody reads for a job, whether it's academic or anything else. If you, it seems generic, it's gone. If if you write anything generic, it's the fastest way to end up it, in the last century. It would have been a wastebasket, but in this case, you know, it's a the delete key on your computer. So, ChatGPT is great as a starting point, but you actually have to fill in the details if you're going to use it at all to help you. And if if it reads the same as somebody else's, you know, that's a total torpedo on blowing up your application. And if somebody else has similar qualifications to you, that runs a really high risk in ChatGPT of generating the same paragraph. So be really careful if you're gonna use that as a help for what you wanna do. Yep. And so there's also a plagiarism risk here. Um, you're thinking about what counts as your own work, your own um, articulation of your background. It's really important for you to be genuine and um, using your own language, your own words for that. You can use tools. We all use, I think, uh, Word and, and word correction. And there, we've got uh, generation and text generation that is part of our processes for generating text. Um, but if it's not yours, if it's not your own, um, be especially careful that you're not pulling something accidentally from someplace else. And we know that ChatGPT and other large language um, models, right? They, those are pulling from various texts and, and putting them together. So you don't want to, to run the risk of accidentally putting something out there that is clearly not your own. And the whole trick to getting a job is to make sure that your unique greatness shows up in the letter so that they actually know that, you know, you're different than everybody else. Because if they're getting anywhere from 100 to 200 of these, they're looking for people that are special. So using a device that's going to try and take the best average is asking to get deleted. Yeah. And I would just um, point your eye to the generalities of the chat GPT. On the one hand, it's fabulous for generating structure and recognizable structure. I think we can all look at this and say, you know, that's that's a one page cover letter that looks pretty good. Um, but when you start getting into the language of it, you know, throughout my academic and research career, I've published several peer reviewed articles. This might be for you a good draft and just saying a placeholder of, of, but several peer reviewed articles in prestigious journals and presented my work in numerous national and international conferences. That's wonderful, but there's absolutely no detail there. And there's no way for um, a department or um, even an industry um, position for them to look at this and kind of understand who you are as a scholar or who you would be as a colleague. And how you would fit in the culture or you know, in their research focus or what they're particularly looking for. It, it, it's it's a this is a bridge document that ma makes or breaks your ability to go. And one of the things I look for in these when I'm on committees that do this is I look for if somebody's going to move, why are they willing to move? Right. That's something you need to explain to people. It's very personal. It's like, you know, why would you move from California to New York? Right. Yeah. Or why would you move from, you know, Wisconsin to Mississippi? They're there, people are going to want to know how likely you are to actually take a job in a place that might be, you know, geographically limited or be more difficult. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I'm even thinking about um, Stu, the um, hire now for the uh, VPR, the vice president for research position here at CSU, mm -hmm. and the job talk yesterday. And um, the candidate is a VPR at another state-funded uh, institution that is a peer institution to CSU. And that was one of the points that he made absolutely clear was why it is that he would jump from that institution, which he says is doing a fabulous job, right? He loves being there, but why it is that he would want to, to make a move. So it becomes crucial then for us to be able to understand even on our end, right? And giving feedback. Yes. Yeah, no, for a job opening we had Liz, over the summer, we there were a couple of people interviewing or wanted to who applied, but from another state, from Michigan or whatever it was. And the key part of their letter that made it possible is they explained why they were moving to Fort Collins anyway. And so they weren't, you know, it wasn't going to be a, a big upheaval. They were going to be looking for a position, you know, in the location where we are. So yeah. It, yeah. It and that's different. just it does. And that's just something that ChatGPT is not going to be able to generate for you. Right. I want to talk about common types of application statements. Um, depending on the type of position you're, you're applying for, that you, know, you may be asked to write all of these, or you might just be asked to produce one or two. Um, I want to talk about academic statements that make up your dossier. There's a thesis statement, perhaps, and why it is it you're, you're applying for that position. Uh, you can think about that in, in the cover letter. That is your argument on why it is that you are a good fit for that institution and Stu spent a, a great a good time and, and a, um, a, did a great job in explaining why it is that the cover letter is important and how it is that you can specialize that to your purposes. Um, you may be asked to produce a teaching philosophy or a statement of your teaching practice, a research and statement. Oh, go ahead. Just make sure that you have a philosophy. I mean, I was advising somebody many years ago who wanted a position and he was a postdoc at Harvard. And the thing he had never thought about was what his teaching philosophy was. I said, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have a teaching philosophy, go help teach, you know, do something that's gonna get you to be able to write and discover what your teaching philosophy is. In his case, you know, he could go help teach. In your case, you're at Colorado State University. Tilt is really good at having things that will help you develop a teaching philosophy. So take advantage of it mm -hmm. when you start thinking about the job. Yep, yep. And some of that is just stepping back. I think we um, get trained or we go and do, and we often don't think about the reasons why. And that philosophy is the it's being able to articulate the reason why um, behind the scenes. Same thing with a research statement or having a research plan um, and a diversity statement on the reasons why and how it is you're connecting with others. So let's talk about these, these um, philosophy statements or... Um, materials that make up your dossier. Um, some of you may be using something like Interfolio or a dossier service uh, in order to be able to submit your application. Some of you might be um, creating files depending on where it is that you're, you're um, uh, applying, what types of jobs. So you'll, your dossier will change. And just as, as you mentioned with the cover letters, it will be customized to fit the applications <clears throat> and where it is that you're applying. Um, and as you move through your career, you will be generating multiple dossiers for different types of promotion and being able to demonstrate the quality of the work that you're doing. So this is just the beginning of thinking about these kinds of statements, why you do what it is that you do. And that teaching philosophy statement is just a perfect purposeful reflection. Um, it's about your teaching and learning values, your beliefs, your practices, your experiences, your growth and learning. And one of the best ways to put this together is for you to stop and write down some very specific and meaningful experiences that you've had in the classroom, um, whether it be guest teaching, guest lecturing, um, doing something that, or teaching a course on your own, developing a course, whatever those experiences are, I would start with just journaling out and just writing down um, some of, what, of the, your experiences and what you found most meaningful and valuable in those. Uh, try to get into the headspace where you're, you're really grounded in your own experience before you start thinking about philosophy or a statement and structure and what it is that you might need to tell someone else about who you are and what you know. The diversity statement, same kind of practice, same thing. You really wanna get grounded in um, some sort of sense of an experience of your experiences and beliefs and what it is that you, you are committed to in diversity. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment and have some kind of practical ways to kind of arrange and, and um, talk about these statements or put these statements together as well. But that reflective process that I'm recommending, it really does help you produce highly structured and formal documents that are readable on the other end. 
So a lot of this formalism that goes into job applications, job application statements, that formalism is uh, kindness to the readers on the other end who may be reading through not just a dozen or two dozen, but they may be reading through hundreds of applicants applications to be able to determine who's a go going to be that kind of best candidate, someone they, who's going to lead their, their um, uh, unit forward in various ways, who's going to be a good colleague. And so they want you, your goal right then there is to show them who you are on the page. Don't just tell them. Do so you mentioned that the CV is this kind of list of just what it is that you've done. It's kind of like box checking. You've just listed it off. So they could read through and they can see that list and they can kind of glean a little bit of the details of your background. But your statements and your cover letter, this is a place where you get to tell the story of what that CV is, what all of that work is that you've done, and to be able to show them who it is that you're going to be as that colleague. So again, being as specific as possible, super helpful. Um, if you're curious about the difference between showing and telling um, and rhetorically how that is, just look on, on YouTube and look up show not tell in um, language or telling a story and you can get some really great um, advice on, on how to do that, how to, to show not tell. The CV is largely telling the um, cover letter, the teaching statement, the diversity statement. Those are going to be showing who it is that you are. So that teaching you want to be able to give them snapshots and images of you in the classroom, you and, and um, the department and working on curriculum committees or as a guest presenter. Um, however it is that you have done some work, you want to be able to show them that. And then you want to connect it to the broader um, ideals or uh, philosophies or uh, ways, that, ways that you generally function as a teacher. So you want to go from something specific where they can really picture you and then make a broader connection to what that means and tells them about your beliefs about teaching, what it is that you believe that, you know, in, your instruction can do or be. Same thing then also with the diversity statement. You want to be talking about the places where you exchange information or ideas across differences, how it is that you've collaborated on teams, how it is that you work with perhaps administrators or folks who are in different areas or, or of different races, um, uh, genders of different kind of ranks and disciplines, all of those professional characteristics and categories that you encounter in academe, which are really, really broad in graduate school. Talk about those differences. Um, it, you don't have to manufacture anything and you don't often have to go to your prior experiences unless they're, they're useful into your personal background. If your personal background does help you articulate how it is that you've engaged in these kind of professional and collegial conversations and, and connections um, across differences, then by all means, bring it into your diversity statement, but you're not required to. So you think about that teaching philosophy statement and how it is that you might be able to put it together. Again, that elusive quality of showing who you are in, in the classroom. Um, you just want to make sure that you are focusing on the students and their learning first and what you, you believe about that learning second. It's a really easy way to, to be able to know that you are showing them student learning. What's, what's the impact of you being in that classroom with 20, 30, or 100 other students, right? And think about how this is different in this century as opposed to last century. There are an increasing number of publications out there about flipping classrooms and how to engage more people and you know how that depends on the number of students in a given class. This is more complicated than it was 10, 20 years ago, right? So yeah. don't, don't take this lightly because it will be important for any position that you apply for. Yep. So if you think about that with the technology, any technology you're mentioning, it's not just that you're, you're good with it, it's that how that technology allows for you to enable student learning. Um, just like Stu was saying, you know, anything that, that um, is helping you uh, communicate with students and that maybe new models of teaching, flipped classroom models, I think, are, yeah, um, really cool to bring in and talk about. But so those are, could be some of the things, that, the broader things that you talk about after you've shown them who you are, the assignments that you've worked with and other things. Um, you can find or recall pithy, like short little statements um, from your scholars or mentors that represent your own beliefs. So for example, something from John Dewey, um, American educator and philosopher, says education is not a preparation for life, education is life itself. So it's possible if you're showing and you want all of this to be aligned, that's how you create a statement that is easy to read and, and, and fully connected and integrated. 
is that the examples that you're using are showing then perhaps the classroom management, the technology and other things, and then they pull together and you've got this pithy statement or this, this guiding statement, or maybe even a statement from if you have student evaluations and someone has said something glowing and it helps you kind of pull together the broader ideas of what it is that you're showing um, your readers. There are lots of, of resources and we will post these slides, by the way, as a resource on a share drive along with the recording so you can access that so you don't have to be writing these down or screenshotting or, or taking those. But there are a fair number of um, texts out there, as Stu was mentioning, lots of, of research done in education studies um, about teaching and learning. And if you are looking for some of those resources, like John Dewey, here we go, my pedagogical creed, pedagogical creed. Um, these, I stole all of this list from our colleagues in the School of Education. And so I know it's a, it's a great list. The other thing to consider when you go to your, your uh, national meetings in your field, and, and this sort of, I, as I was growing up in academia, I, I hadn't really thought about this much because I was primarily a researcher before I came to CSU. Um, there are some really interesting sessions at any international meeting on teaching. And this was particularly prevalent when I started going to biomedical engineering meetings, that there some of the better sessions were actually on, on teaching. And so when you start really seriously thinking about jobs, look at the program in your favorite fields um, annual meeting and find out, you know, what are they talking about in teaching so that you can be up on that. You know, you don't have to go by something that was published in 2017. You can talk about at a meeting you went to last year, you know, the following topic was brought up and you thought it was really good. Yeah. And if you can, if it's possible that you integrate that into your teaching or bring it back into a, a lecture or share it out with colleagues or connect with it, you can build that in. It's a great way then to also on the slide demonstrate how you continue to do your professional development around teaching. It's a way that you would show who you would be as a colleague and what your, those interests are. And it would, of course, be on your CV, right, that you have done this professional development or you've gone to this conference. But this is one of the ways that you could bring out some of the detail of that conference. Um, it's not going to be on your CV that you attended a session on teaching, but the fact that you can reference it then in your statement, then it highlights and shows the value of, that you brought forward from that conference, from that one CV line. So you can also, by the way, the professor is in, um, is a, if you haven't, if you are not familiar with um, uh, her work, uh, Karen, I'm blanking on, Felsky, nope, blanking on her last name, but the professor is in, She's got these pearls of wisdom for the um, job market and she's got some great resources. So check it out. All right. So I also highly recommend, and we do this in a lot of CSU rights, uh, short courses and, and um, uh, techniques or, or reverse outlining statements that you appreciate that sound um, like something that you would want to emulate that you you like them and you would you would trust whoever it is that wrote that and you you like the kind of ways that they've integrated their personal experience with the their belief system for example <clears throat> and so go through and identify how it's put together just like you know kind of like pulling to, to a part of piece of furniture how, what goes where and how is it structured? And that allows for you then to kind of mull it over and think about how would you then structure your own? This is not the same thing as plagiarism. This is not um, a risk of, you know, using other work, other people's work as your own. You don't want to steal their language, but what you do want to do is see like, how did they express who they were to other people so that you could get a picture of who they are as teachers in the classroom. And there's some other great resources um, at the University of Michigan. So you can pull up teaching philosophies. They have them based on um, field. So you can look at field specific ones. These are great. Um, you can look at ones in, in your field that are, are closely related if there's not a field that's directly um, in your field. And you can just kind of see if you know, you're applying for that biomedical engineering job, just take a look and see who's, what do those statements look like and read a lot of them. Which ones are the ones that stand out? Which ones don't? I did not put that at the top of the list. And nothing oh, no. to do with the University of Michigan teaching philosophy. It's just super convenient for our purposes. Oh. Or the, the symmetry of the, the color blue for all yeah. of the statements. Um, but again, these are um, just a reminder that they have on their website giving you those statements of purpose to not pull from them. Just as, It's just a reminder. You want to have enough time in writing these documents out 
and thinking about who you are, that kind of reflection process, spend some time with this so that you're not at risk of pulling other people's language as your own. You want to be able to express things in your own words, in your own way, um, in part because that's how people are going to, to know who you are as a colleague as you move forward. Those diversity statements, there's a fair amount of advice out there. And we'll also talk a little bit about the national context for writing diversity statements right now. Um, but I really like this advice. Um, this comes from Peachy um, Essay, but how to write a diversity statement in telling your story, taking into account common um, understandings of diversity equity, that you're placing your story within the context of some understanding of uh, thinking about teaching philosophy, right? That you have some understanding of what that philosophy is. Um, parallelism should be avoided, meaning that you're not saying, I understand what other people are like or feel because I have friends, right, who or I too feel that way. Um, describe what you've done to help underrepresented students if you've done that work. Um, it could be in coaching, it could be advising, it could be mentoring, it could be um, some very specific group that you were working with, it could be curricular. Describe programs that you've conducted, write about your commitment. So what that means institutionally for the program, and then modify your, your statement to where you intend it, to send, uh, send it. And again, that kind of really making sure that you understand what the institution or what that department is, is looking for um, when they ask for a diversity statement. And so you really want to share um, how it is that you interact with people who are different from you. That's what a diversity statement is and what your beliefs are about that um, difference. Um, you can think about diversity and inclusion broadly. That's my encouragement. And um, I also encourage you to think about um, our own philosophy, um, say, or excuse me, our own principles of um, uh, inclusion and diversity here at the university. We'll talk about that in a moment. And you can, so, But you can also ground your experience then in your lived experience or existing uh, proven models. And so that's where knowing that we have the principles of community at CSU that are guided by um, diversity, equity, and inclusion models that you can ground it in something that's here at CSU that's part of our cultural conversation. And you can kind of make sure that you, you um, uh, build that into your letter. Again, thinking about diversity broadly and widely, we're not just thinking about it in terms of um, the kind of internal dimensions or external dimensions, or organizational dimensions. It can be across all of those dimensions of um, who you are as a race, gendered person, or how it is that you are functioning within your department as someone who has occupied a particular position within that department in relation to administration or the work that you've done and working across those differences. If you've been on committees where you're um, representing graduate students, for example, that is a place of difference where you are one perhaps graduate student among many who are faculty members or administrators. And how do you reach across and how did you engage with that process? So there's any number of ways that you can approach diversity. I would start though, again, with your own personal experiences and then start to see how it is that that connects more broadly to philosophies, to belief systems and to be able to articulate uh, from that perspective. Then it means that you're owning it, right? To say yeah. just as all the other letters we're talking about, they have to point out how your unique experiences created you, the person that is applying for the job. So the more you can give examples that fit the description you want to put, the better and less generic it will sound. Right? There's there's yeah. a reason that you need diversity to design anything in the planet today because you need to take into consideration all of the different people that you want to work with. Yeah, and this goes, particularly if you're thinking about this for industry jobs, other types of jobs not in academe, um, while you're most likely to encounter something like a, a teaching statement or philosophy for an academic job, diversity statements can be included in, in any number of other positions or jobs. So thinking about it pretty broadly and worldly, right? Um, and industry particularly cares about how you work in teams. If they don't picture you as a team player, then it ain't going any place. And that's really critical that there's diversity on teams because diverse teams work better and they produce more. And that's been in studies for the last 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that you can do, stop and think about your experiences, consider how it connects right to another source. 
something like our principles of community um, or general belief system, other system. That way it's not just you saying, out of my experience, I know X, Y, and Z, that you're able to, to frame your experience in a much larger conversation that's important for people to be able to see and hear. And then generate a list of scholars and others who, who reflect that, that maybe you can connect to that would be relevant. Yeah, and there's gonna be a recording of this, so we will share it out as, um, uh, after the session. Some broader context, if you're high, applying for academic jobs um, here in the United States, um, if you go to the Chronicle of Higher Education, I pulled this uh, these um, numbers a couple days ago, but their diversity statements are not without controversy right now. There are some states that require and, and encourage diversity statements be included in um, faculty or postdoc or other applications for their institutions. And there are other states that are trying to limit it. So I would, if depending on where you're applying, I would go and check the Chronicle Higher, Higher Education and just take a look and see where it is that diversity statements are in that, that context. Um, so you have some states, for example, that um, have in introduced legislation to restrict diversity statements specifically. And so you can see where those statements are. Um, some of it you can see that where those states are that have DEI offices and staff that are, are um, under consideration legislatively or mandatory DEI trainings or identity-based preferences and hiring. And you can kind of see what that conversation might be like. But I think that if you're going with your own, your own experiences and you're connecting your experiences to other belief systems and um, kind of proven models or other things, you should be you should be good to go. Just be honest and genuine, but also be aware that there's some states may not ask, or some states where um, your statement um, may be weighted in, in different ways. So again, I, I highly recommend if you've been part of um, like CSG Rights, a CSG Writing community, you could pull down like what do these, what are these beliefs, and when we come together and how we operate best together, um, and work across differences across all colleges and um, departments at, at the university. And I've already mentioned our principles of community at CSU. I highly recommend again taking time to do this, um, craft multiple lengths of your statements. You can do a 30 second version if you can boil it down. This is great for when you prepare for interviews. A three minute version where you can ex expound a little bit. You can explain just a little bit more on, in detail on why it is you believe what, what it is that you believe or something that you could integrate then into a teaching demonstration or a job talk, something where you're um, an interview where you're talking about um, who you are either as a teacher or as um, a colleague. When you're writing your statements and this is regardless of, of what which one it is, it's a cover letter, it's a teaching statement, um, listen for authenticity, consider whether everything there really represents who you are and the work that you've done. Does it present you well? Do you see and hear potential? So you, this is the, the question that allows for you to kind of take away the imposter feelings or that somehow you need to be everything for everyone. Just you, you need to have show them that you have potential for growth in that position. And is it genuine, specific, and relevant to that position, which is everything that we've been talking about so far in these statements. All right, so, and if you ever need someone to kind of go over or talk about what those, what you've got in your statements or you want to um, have further conversations, please reach out to me, Quinn at colostate.edu. I'm also available through CSU rates. And then we wanna talk about this, the career plan. And Stu, we've got like just three or four minutes if we could do it quickly so we have enough time for q and A. I, I'm gonna keep it short because for the most part, a lot of the things that we've talked about apply to research statements. The really critical additional thing to consider about a research statement is they're looking for the your potential as a researcher to be a funded researcher. If it's at a university or even if it's at a company, they wanna know what your productivity potential is. Will you deliver if you say that you have an idea, right? So if you go to the next slide, right? You, you need to give them in this research statement an idea of how important your projects are and why you are particularly fit and qualified to do these kinds of projects and why now is a particularly good time. They're opening a job now, then they're looking for somebody now. And so you have to be at the point in your career where you can make the case that you're in a really good position, 
a lot of times it's because you just got a grant or a lot of times it's because you know you just had a big paper published or whatever that is that's going on in your life in terms of how you want your career to go and whatever you've accumulated as indicators of productivity, those are the things that are gonna go into that research statement that will make a big difference, right? So go to the next. So there's a lot of things that you can put into the research statement that, you know, that are listed on the slide in terms of, you know, what is your research career look like? But to a large extent, one of the things they're looking for is a little bit like the next slide. So you can read that because you'll have the video. Um, is they want to know what are in your grants. What are you proposing to do that you would come in there and write a grant about within the next six to 12 months, right? So if you recently submitted a grant, and I strongly advise that that would be a condition under which you would apply for a job, if it's going to require research, teaching, and service, um, that you actually have a grant that's going out into the world. So use that specific aims that you had to do for that grant, put it into part of your research statement that makes it really clear that this is what you would be funded to do, either because you already have the money or because this is the grant that you're putting in. This is what you think about always doing. They will look at that and evaluate it relative to their existing faculty or people in their company or whatnot and say, God, if this person were to get the money to do this project, it would fit perfectly with what we do. And that's how they would get the perfect match between what it is that you do and what it is they do. And that would put you in the situation where you're where you should be, right? Where everybody's working and rowing in the same direction in that in that boat, right? And really, Oops, you don't sorry, want Steve. a job that's going to be so different. You can go to go to the next piece. But the Everything about getting a job is about getting you into the right position, not just having a job, but having the job that will maximize your success. And that's really the bottom line. Yeah, agreed. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and the, stop the recording so we can open it up for some Q&A. I'm sure there are some burning questions um, in the room, so I'm gonna stop that recording.